and welcome back to the Creative Boom podcast. I'm your host, Katie Cowan, and I'm also the founder of Creative Boom, a platform which I started in 2009 to support the creative community. This is season two of our podcast, and I'm kicking things straight off with somebody who you will know as an award-winning graphic designer and artist, but somebody who unexpectedly became one of my friends last year during the pandemic. Sarah Boris has worked for some of the world's leading publishing houses and art organizations, including Fade and Press, the Photographer's Gallery, Tate and Barbican. She notably crafted the fresh identity for the Institute of Contemporary Arts back in 2010, amongst many other impressive pieces of work. But before we get into our conversation with Sarah, which is really interesting because we get to hear her experiences of 2020 and the lessons she learned, let me just say that this podcast has been sponsored by Shillington, the original graphic design boot camp. Since 1997, their innovative approach to education has helped students achieve award-winning portfolios and land incredible jobs in a seriously short amount of time in their campuses in New York, London, Manchester, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and now online. But I'll talk more about them later. Let's first see our chat or hear our chat with Sarah from earlier this month. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the Creative Being Podcast Season 2. You are my first guest. I'm very honoured. Hello, Katie. Thanks for having me on the podcast. <laughs> I'm honoured too. I know. It's, lo- it's lovely to see your face. You, you still look lovely and slim. I've got lockdown pounds. Oh, I can't see that. <laughs> oh, you're, you're too nice. You're too nice. But like, yeah, t- we're in 2021. We kind of thought it was going to be, okay, everything's sorted now. We can get back to normal, but we've come back. Um, we've all had two weeks off and uh, things are quite gloomy, but you're smiling your head off and you're, you actually were the most surprising thing that happened in 2020. Because when I was in one of my darkest moments, and we, I think we all had those moments, didn't we? You turned out to be this surprise friend that I sort of gained in, in those sort of dark moments. I mean, we, we, we went through quite a lot together, didn't we, last year? Yeah, true. I mean, it's surprising. It's I think that's part of the magic of social media. That's why I stay on it. Um, but yeah, no, that's why I'm smiling as well, because I don't know, you're super nice. So <laughs> it's, just, it's just also, I think it's not that easy to meet people in the industry that you can really fully confide, confide in and, mm-hmm. um, you know, where you feel in a really safe space. And I think that was a mutual feeling we both got. It was sort of like, it it was definitely one of the magic things of 2020. I think it's, it was just amazing to be able to make connections without meeting people in person. And and I feel it's weird because I feel like we've known each other for a long time. It's really strange. I feel like we must have been (laughs) friends in another life or something. Not not that I believe that stuff. Maybe we were sisters. (laughs) Maybe. You know what? Maybe. Because it it was just like instant, just got each other. And it's very rare that you come across people like that in your life. And I think, you know, I'm not going to get too soppy. I am a little... I I, I could get emotional, (laughs) so beware. (laughs) Well, I can get emotional. As you, If you've listened to any of these other podcasts, I can get very emotional and and I am an emotional person. It's, you know, I'm quite proud in saying that I've got a big heart. Um, But you, um, yeah, we, we just kind of hit it off straight away. And I think when you find somebody like that in your life, you have to hold on to them. So you're not going to get rid of me um, easily, Sarah Boris. I'm glad to hear that. I hope you don't disappear on me. <laughs> I will not, but you do realise you're my third Sarah friend and I have to call all of my Sarahs by their full names, um, which is hilarious. It's like an ongoing joke with the other two Sarahs. So you've got competition. Oh no, who are the other two? <laughs> are they also creatives or... Well, sort of. I will introduce you um, to them one day and it will be like the universe explodes. <laughs> <laughs> I, tend to get a, I, I tend to get along well with other Sarahs. I have oh, quite a lot go. of Sarah friends as well, but I'm, I'm not exclusive with Sarahs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned that it's hard for hard to find people to to sort of confide in and and feel that you can trust them especially in the design industry which can feel a little bit cutthroat sometimes can't it yeah yeah i think um 
I think I think it's the industry has evolved definitely since I started um, working in 2005, and I, I think people are a lot more open and human than what I felt 15 years ago. Um, but I also don't know. It, it could also have be me that has evolved, and that is more willing to open up. Um, so I think, I mean, I, it's quite a nice moment to be in 15 years later yeah because you, I think you've got this journey which helps you reflect on things and helps you be I guess also more content with where you are I think when you start when you start out you're just sort of in this thing where you have all these models of what the industry is and how it should be and how you should be in that industry and I've realized that all all those things I thought 15 years ago were actually not exclusive and not, not also the full picture. So. Yeah, yeah. I think, it, I think you're right. I think a lot has changed in 15 years and I forget cause you look so youthful that, you know, <laughs> there was no, <laughs> just for the purpose of our listeners, Sarah just sort of like raised her hands up and went Rah! <laughs> like a bat. Like, like a, little... a bat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> I can't remember what I was saying now. You just make me laugh. <laughs> oh, you said I was looking very youthful, which you yes, can repeat. You are. <laughs> yes, you, you are. are. You know, and so, well, I, I'm doing okay. Although I think, yeah, gosh, I are. mean, the, the stresses of 2020, I think I, I finally looked in the mirror the other day and went, oh my God, Katie Cowan, you are getting old. No, um, you're not. <laughs> I, I think we're only at the beginning of our lives. And I think also yes. that the age thing is really interesting, I think, as well, because I actually feel you know, really young. And I, I, you know, 10 years ago, I had a lot of people in their forties telling me, Oh, you know, I've had a really hard point in my career and it feels a bit like work is fading out. And, oh, you know, and, and, and it was almost this picture, like when you reach, you know, your mid thirties, your forties, it's like the end of a path. And actually I feel like it's only the beginning. And yeah, I would definitely urge anyone feeling that, that to look in a different way. Again, it's an image you're sold that is wrong. Do you ever feel like with this younger crowd coming up beneath us, do you ever feel that, you know, you have to sort of push on constantly? Um, well, I actually feel that um, we're all complementary. You know, I have an experience that they don't have and I hope a bit of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> that that I can share and in, in industry insights, you know, and, and things like that. Um, but I think definitely the young crowd, I mean, you know, the, the sort of younger generation coming out, is just so versatile and they, you know, handle so many softwares, so many technical things. And there was, you know, I'm, I'm sort of curious of, of lots of different platforms and sort of, you know, doing animation and stuff, but I, it's it's sort of, you know, not in me to start juggling uh, 20 different sort of, you know, um, platforms. And, and I think I've reached a moment where I'm really comfortable also with that and thinking actually we're complementary and we can collaborate with that generation. It's not, for me, it's not so much about the competition, but it's about the collaboration and how we come together um, collectively to work together rather than against each other. Um, that's a great sentiment. And I think, um, also, um, it's about realizing that actually, yes, we have got all this experience and it, it's keeping the eyes on the prize, isn't it? Having that focus, we've got all this experience in one area, you know, there's, there's a lot of value in that. Um, mm. especially if you become known for, for it, um, and, and that can sort of, you know, hold your reputation well. Yeah. I hope um, so. I mean, I, I definitely also had this you know, like last year was really strange because a lot of work dropped off. And so you have a lot of moments of doubt and sort of, am I still valid? Do people still want to work with me? What's going on? I mean, obviously, you know, there's a pandemic and there's Brexit and there's a, lo a whole lot of other things. And, and, and it's sort of also taking a step back in that moment and sort of looking at where you're at and what you're doing and if you're content with that and what you could push further. And, and, and I think there's obviously also a lot of anxiety seeing other people's outputs. And, yeah. and I think one thing that I've done is actually 
when I, I have that anxiety creeping up is to actually refocus on what it is that I want to do, who that I want to work with, who I want to connect with, what I want to learn. Also, there's so many things I still want to learn um, and things I want to do. And, you know, whether it's in lockdown or not, I, I think, you know, within the confines of our homes as well, there's, I mean, luckily I have books, I have internet that sometimes works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> and and I, and I think I still have yeah, a lot of things to learn and study and and also you know, connections to be made. So it that's a great positive mindset. I think many of us have had to make that adjustment. Um because when it all kicked off last March, was it? Um I mean the the shock and the and the horror of, yeah. of the reality we were facing. It was just, a, it was crazy. I remember having conversations with my husband, Tom, who's also, he also works for himself. He's a software developer. And we just went through everything and we checked, are we going to be okay? And and as it turned out, we were. And um, we ended up doing better than uh, we anticipated and worked really, really hard and, and burnt That's ourselves amazing. out. Yeah, well, I think we've done really well. Was that like, wow. cause, but, but you know, he we felt guilty because other people were really suffering, weren't they? Yeah. yeah. It's difficult. I think in a way you shouldn't feel guilty because I also feel, you know, it's, it's a difficult time and it's almost, I mean, it's reassuring to know that some people are doing well. And I think if everyone was doing, you know, really badly, it, I think it would be a sign that we're really doomed <laughs> and that it's, you know, it's sort of, and, and I think for me to see people doing well is, is sort of giving also hope that things aren't completely stuck and that things can keep happening and people are keen also to make things happen still. And, and I think, I mean, also it's just been amazing to have platforms like Creative Boom that are so supportive and that, you know, keep nurturing people. And um, again, I, I think it's really important to have this idea of nurturing one another and, and, and having positive, healthy platforms that show a wide spectrum of work. Definitely. And, um, you know, that's that's what we've always tried to do, um, just support people no matter where they are in their career. And I, I feel like last year was just this reminder of why we exist and, and why we started in the first place. And, you know, we started after the global recession of 2008 and, you um, back then there were so many people struggling. And so last March and April just felt very similar. However, just completely on another scale. So it was, it was, I, I felt like I had a duty to step up and do more. And I, we started a chat room and I oh, would yeah, just I spend, yeah, how, do you remember? How, how was it, the chat room? It worked, it worked really well and it was very old school. So it was like, you know, quite nice to go back to a, a traditional um, chat room message board and the community that came out of that albeit small was really wonderful and I made some really lovely friends that I'm you know I had a couple of emails after Christmas from some um just to, uh, wishing me a happy new year and and thanking me again for this chat room that you know my husband Tom set up in you know a couple of hours or whatever it, it started off really well there were loads of people that joined I think we had about 1800 wow. people sign up but I think when people realised that things weren't as dire, um, it started to sort of, you know, it served its purpose over a couple of months and then people started started to peter off. And it was quite interesting. It was quite an interesting little uh, little thing that we did last year. Um, but so what what else did you sort of experience? It sounds like you really slowed down and given that you are so successful and have had such an amazing career, I can imagine you've been running and running on a treadmill for a very long time. So I suppose it, in a, in a strange way, it was quite nice for you to just do that, take a step back. Yeah. I mean, in the, um, I did feel definitely that I had been racing for the last couple of years. And, and I think, you know, it was purely from my own, you know, responsibility and desire to do a lot of things. And I think more and more I had aspirations that were different, um, you know, and it's normal, like things shift and you, you know, I, th there was also a part of me that wanted to spend more time doing my artworks, uh, screen printing, um, also publishing my own books, um, you know, and, and also mainly experimenting more. 
Um, and, and I think, um, you know, I started that when I left my full-time job um, at a publisher, uh, Fiden, in 2015. And that, that was, you know, was triggered by an opportunity to experiment and sort of stage my practice within an exhibition space. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think when I think back at that, you know, a lot of people said, oh, well, you know, you took a risk by doing that. But I, I also, I didn't see it really as a risk. I saw it as an opportunity um, and, and as a platform for expression. And I, and I think that's really what's happened in, in the five years since, I mean, I guess now we're nearing six years that I left my full-time job and sort of set up my own practice. And, and, and for me, it's, it's just been a journey of constant discovery. And I guess also slowing down, doing, you know, traveling more, spending more time with family pre pandemic, um, and, and really catching up with things that I love, but also people that I love and, uh, you know, sort of finding a more, I, I guess, human way of working, um, and less sort of yeah, definitely. machine I think, productivity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we're not machines, yeah. are we? And I think, I, I don't think I ever really got over that first sort of, you know, recession when I lost all my clients oh, wow. overnight, bar one, um, back in 2009, 2008, 2009, which is why I had all that time, spare time to do something like creative being. That's amazing. Um, but I've been running ever since, you know, it's just a kind of, you know, it's an awful word, hustle. Oh, yeah. I hate the I word I really don't hustle. like it either. <laughs> it's like hustle, <laughs> hustle and side project are really, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we've been guilty of pushing that on Creative Beam a few times over the years, but I suppose only because I've seen myself the benefit of having side projects yeah. and um, pushing ahead. But yeah, I think in the kind of, uh, in the warmth and the kind of well-meaning of it all, we all kind of fell for it a bit too much and um, probably pushed ourselves too yeah. hard. And in some, in some cases, probably burnt ourselves out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, last year for many, many people in the creative industries, um, was a chance to just step back and, and go, okay, this is happening. What can I do positively yeah. whilst I've got this extra time? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, with, with those things sort of, I, a lot of people were like, oh, are you going to take this time to do your side project and, you know, and, and do these books you've been wanting to do and. And I, I sort of have from, from March to December to do all these things and I've not completed one. And it's, it wasn't even because <laughs> I didn't have time because finally I had time, but I just, I just felt like doing other things and just, you know, kind of reading, catching up with people, you know, the, the walks became really important, sort of the outside time became really precious. And I think it's almost a sort of awakening to things that have been right in front of you for all these years and that you've, you know, you've sort of, it's not that you didn't value them. It's just, you didn't spend time with them. Um, and I think, yeah, I think we have, we have amazing access to culture. Um, we've got sort of, you know, there are no borders online, so we can speak with people from across the oceans and yeah. that's amazing. And we can access, each other's cultures more easily and learn from each other. And I think, I think these are really the things that drive me at the moment. And, and to sort of, I mean, I definitely have some moments where I feel really low and really like, okay, what's next, what's yeah. going to happen? You know, is, is work, you know, going to, is there going to be enough All completely work? Normal. And, um, how, how do we navigate this? And, you know, I even had a moment where I thought, is it worth, making these side projects because I, I almost feel like it's quite a strange time to be flogging things to people like flogging artworks and books. And, and, and I have, a, you know, I've always loved my, my sort of non-commissioned work in the sense that I've never felt pressure to earn a living with those. And now that's shifted a, mm. a little bit because I've had less commissions due to the pandemic. And I've sort of, yeah. started seeing if I could make more of a living of my artworks and books and, and things like that. And suddenly it's putting a different type of uh, pressure on these. And, and so I'm sort of assessing 
how that's working for me at the moment and where I want to take this. But it's definitely, you know, there's, there's another amazing thing that happened to me last year, which, you know, feels really like, I don't know. I, I also feel like it's an immense chance to have had that, but I've had printmakers approaching me and sort of, you know, offering to collaborate and to make my artworks come to life through amazing screen printing or letterpress techniques. Um, and so I've been, you know, working with uh, people like uh, Harvey Lloyd's screens, uh, the amazing Steve and Tracy, um, that are just the most amazing sort of friendly and skilled screen printers I've met. And, and there's also been a uh, damn fine print with Kim Willoughby that is just also amazing at nurturing the print community and mm -hmm. bringing people together. And, and also because suddenly I had the time to make these and to, mm. you know, think about how and, and actually push them a little bit further out. Usually I, I don't even communicate about those prints that I make because there's no pressure to, to sell. Yeah. And, and, and having also another collaboration, I, I had um, New North, New North Press that are based in uh, London, in Old Street, uh, get in touch. And uh, it's run by Richard and Graham. And, you know, I, I went there and I felt so good. And I, it also made me think, you know, what, what, what do I like about the graphic design industry? And I actually feel so much more at home in the print um, making environment. And it, and it made me think a lot about that and, and how we make each other feel in different industries. And why is it that the printmaking industry is so warm and friendly? And why is it that this, sometimes the graphic design industry puts on this very sort of almost clinical, um, you know, facade. And, and so then, you know, I thought, yeah. is it me? Have I been rang hanging out in the wrong spaces or, or, or have I been, <laughs> you know, with the wrong people. And I, I mean, I've also met amazing people in the graphic design industry, but I, I, I just felt that in the space of my sort of printmaking journey, since I left my full-time job, I've just had this really amazing connections and it, not one person has ever made me feel bad and everyone has made me feel extremely mm -hmm. welcome. And, and it's suddenly it's mm -hmm. a sort of fresh outlook that you can be whoever you want to be. And there are no codes or labels um, and, and I've really loved that. So, and, and just seeing printed work is there's something, there's a commitment to the, to the printed uh, matter. And it's, it's something that you have to weigh and balance and, and, and you get it out there and it's sort of, you know, I, I think there's something quite fleeting with the digital and, and there's obviously mm. there's a lot of printmakers, but there's, I think there's a lot of noise with the digital, which is, which I love as well, the digital um, arena, but. Nah, screw the digital, <laughs> they can get lost. <laughs> but, but yeah, and I, I think for me, just being able to make those things during lockdown and so, to, so I went to New North yeah. Press in between lockdowns and, and just getting my hands dirty and wearing an apron, which I, I never wear aprons normally. Wearing yeah. an apron. So I wore this amazing apron and, and, and being in touch with these people and just, standing there in, in their space and being welcome and, and sort of making me think like, actually, this is where I feel really, really good and really happy and really mm. thriving. And, and so it's made me think a little bit about how in some ways, thanks to the pandemic, it's made me shift a little bit my practice because I've had more time to spend on my artistic practice. Um, and, and how maybe I should, really make more space for it in the years to come that and obviously that is a risk but i think uh, until you make space for things there's no you you don't know how they're going to work out and i think that's what happened when i left the full-time job and and again with you with creative boom is something happens an, a, an immense crisis and suddenly something beautiful is born out of it so what a, a joyful, positive mindset. You know, this This is great. Anybody who's listening to this, who's a graphic designer and uh, an admirer of you and your work, and I'm sure there I are hope. many, <laughs> myself included. 
<laughs> um, but it's really reassuring to hear somebody with so much experience who's had so much success um, to say these things. You know, you have your moments of self-doubt and you've kind of, you know, had struggles. And, and, and actually last year you didn't have the mind space or the energy, um, apologies if I'm putting words into your mouth, um, to uh, push on and, and do those books and do those other side projects that, that awful <laughs> word again. Um, but uh, uh, it's great. It's really encouraging. Um, and, you know, in, in a sense, I, I, think, I think you're right. Sometimes we have to just take a step back and, and have the, the, the opportunity to explore However, it's not easy when we're all sort of pushing on and trying to yeah. make a living, especially when the industry is so competitive. And we can, we can, and, and again, you pick up a really interesting point there about how we make these assumptions about what we think people expect mm. of us. And it's all in our head. And I think social media has played a part of that as well. We kind of like, we, we kind of sometimes get lost in that. And it's good to have. And I'm not saying it's good to have a pandemic and that people are dying. Um, my point is it's it's good to have these shakeups yeah. where we're kind of forced, forced to sort of suddenly be in that risky yeah. zone where we haven't got work coming in or it's, yeah. it's, you know, forcing us to change and have a deep look at what our lives are and where we want to go and where we and who we want to be. It's, it's, you know, the silver lining, I suppose. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think, I think again, I, I went through this moment last year of thinking, okay, work is getting really low when, you know, I, I need to prepare, I need to find more work. I need to, you know, I had all these things I was thinking I need to do. I, I need to do a proper website. <laughs> uh, I need to redo my portfolio. I need to <laughs> kind of like prepare a really active pitch. I need to get like press. I need to, you know, get myself out there. And, and then, <laughs> then I thought actually, you know what what do i need to live at the moment and and how can i you know make that living we're taking a short break from our chat with sarah to talk about our sponsor for the season shillington whom without their support this would not be possible since 1997, the original graphic design boot camp has helped students achieve award-winning portfolios and land incredible jobs in a seriously short amount of time from their six campuses around the world. I'm joined now by one of their graduates from Manchester, Ella Dawson. Hello, Ella. Hello. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> no, it's great to, to meet you and um, find out more about your experience with Shillington. Yeah. I mean, how did that come about? So prior to Shillington, I was actually, I actually did an art foundation course um, at Manchester School of Art. And sort of from there on, I was really keen to get into the industry. Um, and I sort of didn't really want to do another three years doing a degree. So I deferred that place. And um, by chance, I actually heard of Shillington through one of my sister's friends. Um, went to the info session, I thought, well, this is exactly, exactly what I want. And that's kind of what took me there, really. That's fantastic. And so did you do the part-time course or the full-time, full whack? No, I, I, um, I did the three-month course, so that's full-time. So in, I think it was half eight to half five, um, just off, it's just outside of Piccadilly Gardens um, in Manchester. So yeah, I was getting the tram every day because I'm just outside of Manchester. So yeah, no, it was, it was good. I bet it was all that hands-on vocational training that you get there um, and, and the ability to, to create a, a portfolio that would ultimately help you get a job. Yeah, no, 100%. I think, I, I mean, I put all my credit to Shillington for creating my portfolio because I think without them, I wouldn't have the sort of support I would have got other like elsewhere for um, sort of briefs yeah. and things. Um, I think that... Um, they sort of sort of need that sort of extra support on you know extra bits and bobs to do with um certain briefs whether that's web or whether that's branding and just gives you a lot more direction as if you're actually in a sort of studio setting definitely and it gets you ready for for the real world I guess and and so what mm. are you doing now so I currently work at a um small creative and digital agency just outside of Manchester called Made by Shape um and I'm brand designer Great. there so uh, yeah, I cover everything to do with branding, um, but we are primarily a digital agency, so um, also also do a lot of web design as well. 
That's fantastic. Are you really enjoying it? And and would you uh, would you recommend Shillington to anyone out there listening who's thinking about a uh, career in graphic design? Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, no, I, I really enjoy it where I am. And as I said before, I put that credit to Shillington for actually getting me that job and, you know, getting me that foot in the door um, for, you know, in the design industry. A hundred percent go for it. If you're if you're thinking about you know, choose if you're umming or ahhing, 100% go for it. That You know, it really opens your eyes to everything and you can find things that you probably wouldn't even realise you like. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time, Ella. No worries. Thank you for having me. If you'd like to find out more about Shillington, go to shillingtoneducation.com. Now, back to Sarah. So, yeah, so that's... That is great that you've been able to sort of slow down and learn these lessons. And, and, you know, I, on the other hand, speeded up and was working, you know, very long hours and and had barely any time to stop and think. But actually, I did realise that um, once and for all, I wanted Creative Boom to be my sort of passion, my thing that I do for, for a very long time. And so I kind of worked on my my site last year I did loads of kind of improvements and um, uh, made lots of changes and hired some new writers and it was very exciting and and um, you know super positive yeah it looks but, really great actually <laughs> oh, thank you I've, I'm still working on it I know uh, <laughs> you, but coming from you that's very flattering thank you <laughs> but that's the thing isn't it we I think I was so hard on myself before 2020. I My expectations for myself and my ventures were so high. And I think when the pandemic happened, um, that kind of just went away. And I started to sort of say, well, actually, I can't be perfect. And I can't, yeah. I can't like be this massive, have these massive successes all the time. Every day is a, a lesson. Every, every week is part of our journey. Um, yeah no matter what stage you're at in your business or career, you're always going to have something else that you need to do. And actually there's joy in that, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, again, I, I think, you know, we, we set the bars, the bars so high to ourselves. And mm. so during lockdown, for example, I, I started this project called Artists at Home. Mm. And it was a way for me to sort of keep, you know, conversations going and sort of also meet, new artists and um and I invited each artist to submit free photos free portraits of themselves at home I was really keen that they would show part of their environment but also their faces <laughs> which wasn't always an easy um feat and a lot of people were actually you know quite reserved or quite defensive or sort of like I've got other things to do and 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 I sort of maintained that for um a couple of I think it was a month or two um mm-hmm. and I had I think over 30 artists taking part and and I had loads more that I wanted to invite. And then I just realized that actually, I mean, again, I I'm feeling for a creative boom because I realized how much work it is to, you know, um, get in touch with people, source the right imagery, um, make sure the images kind of fit with the project and sort of, but also not frustrate people Mm -hmm. and be mindful of, how much people time have spent also making the images. Yeah. So, and I, I realized also like, you know, every venture um, that we have is, is up to our own level of, of, um, you know, precision and commitment and, you know, our idea of perfection. And, and I thought actually, you know, this doesn't have to be anything more than it was during these days. And I don't need to, um, continue it if I don't feel like it. And, and, and I think it's been interesting because I've, I have also met people that, you know, some that I'm collaborating with today. And, and, and for me, it's, it was, you know, it's, it was a very modest project that only happened on social media, but yeah. it really opened eyes on, you know, what it takes also to set up a community and to maintain that and, and to sort of keep it alive. And, and I thought actually, almost at one point I thought this is taking over too much of my time. And I, you know, and, and also people started having expectations and sort of, Oh, and why haven't you featured so-and-so and and why? And, and I just Mm. felt like actually I, I don't have the energy or the mindset to sort of, you know, go into those things. And there's a lot of people that I asked that also never responded or, and, and I think that's the reality of it, of this, you know, whatever we do, there's a lot of, you know, there's the background story, 
that people don't see on the yeah. surface. And, 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 and I thought, okay, actually I've really enjoyed doing this. Now I want to do something else. Um, and so I've, I've sort of gone back to the end of the year looking at, you know, and I thought I'm going to make those books that I've been postponing making. Um, there's, there's one language book actually that I'm preparing. Um, and oh, it's been lovely. actually more than a year in the making. Gosh. Um, <laughs> but this is, um, it's really on, on, uh, on it, it is born out of what I felt with Brexit and, and some of the divisions it's created and some of the, you know, um, comments I've encountered having, a a teeny weeny French accent. <laughs> <laughs> Just a tad. A petit peu. <laughs> Just a little bit. Yeah, it's never it's never left me that accent. But you know, it's it's part of also my identity. Um and yeah. um I guess I shouldn't shy away from it. But but anyway, and and I thought actually let's look at what you know we have in common and let's, you know, look at language, for example, because that's always you know, I I feel like today my uh, level in French and English uh, languages are sort of the same. Um, you know, I do spelling mistakes in both. And mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I've been living 17 years in the UK, mm -hmm. um, which which I guess is a, a long time. And But I've also had, you know, my the people I've met there have been a European family. Mm. Um, and so I've, I've been, you know, hanging out with a lot of Italian, Portuguese, Brazilian, uh, even uh, Korean people and, you know, really international crowd. And I've uh, luckily I've also met English people. <laughs> <laughs> me, me like myself you. included. <laughs> well, we actually yeah, haven't actually, met yet. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's true. Um, I mean, not, not in the, in not person, in the flesh. But we've, we've met, we've met online. Actually, yes. that sounds a little bit like oh. we've, we've been on a dating app or something. <laughs> Well, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's an online app to meet friends. Yeah. <laughs> meet friends. Well, yeah. I'm looking for English friends to improve my <laughs> accent. Um, but but I think again for me it was this sort of you know out of something that I find really terrible and divisive and sort of you know bringing precarity actually to a lot a lot of people and also just meaning that a whole part of the family that I had met, met in the UK started moving out after the the you know the referendum yeah um and and for me it was a little bit transformative because in those moments i obviously have a lot of uh pain and you know a yeah. touch of maybe even depression but i also i don't know somehow the pain kind of um you know leads on to creative uh thinking and and projects and and yeah weirdly you know it's like a heartbreak i i sort of tend to create um you know to to make new things when i have a heartbreak <laughs> luckily yeah. it doesn't happen too often but um <laughs> good <laughs> you know and I, I think brexit was a bit of a heartbreak for me and and so i'm i'm working on a on a couple of language books um that i'm hoping to uh, self-publish or either release with a publisher and um and and they're really you know hopefully i think they're joyful and they're uh, accessible and they are they're not just about graphic design or arts or concrete poetry they're also about um who i am um mm. and how i perceive language and and really my love of words um and and so i think i think again you know I, i'm hoping that's what i can do in 2021 is really you know keep trying to be positive and and sort of i mean yeah just I don't want to pretend I'm positive all the time because it's not true. <laughs> but but I feel like whenever I feel down, it's it's really looking at what is positive in your life. And I I also had this other thing during lockdown where I would go out, um, you know, depending on how much time we were allowed outside. But and I would take a picture and I would say, okay, this is my joyful moment or encounter or observation of the day, and I. I would exchange that with different people who would exchange in turn their joyful encounters. So at one point there were these really funny uh, sharks um, <laughs> in Regent's Canal in London. Um, and it was so random as a sculpture. Um, and it's by a collective called Antipavion. 
Pavilion. Mm-hmm. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. And <laughs> and I just thought, you know, it's it's kind of these moments where you go outside and you just see, uh, you know, um, uh, you find a note on the street, like a sort of someone's left a note fall out of their pocket, or you you find this sort of um, the bark of a tree which looks beautiful. I don't know. It's these little things and. I've had this other thing that's kept me going is I, I'm, I don't know why I really came obsessed with, um, word plates. Um, word plates. I mean, sorry, number plates. Oh, uh, number from plates. Cars. Oh, okay. Um, and, uh, in the UK they have free letters. Um, and, I, and I started spotting words in those, uh, number plates from the cars. <laughs> and so it means that on every walk I, I went for, I would spot a word. So, you know, so, some people had, you know, the word T on their number plates. And I, I just thought it was really funny. And then I thought, actually, this is really poetic. And so I started collecting these words and making sort of sentences with them, with just the three words and, and, and then making books from them. And, and, and I think for me that those are all the little things also that keep me together is, you know, finding joy in the most you know, the smallest thing. I mean, obviously not like <laughs> anything <laughs> well, in the street, but. Yeah. I mean, it's, it sounds like 2020 has actually been really good for you. You've like, you've learned, you've taken a lot out of it. You've learned a lot of lessons. You've, you've, you've probably were grateful for everything in your life before, but maybe it's shone more of a light on the things to be grateful for and the positive mindset and, and, and kind of that adjustment, isn't it? In sort of really saying to yourself, okay, so the future is out of my control, um, which which it probably always was anyway. It's just that with a pandemic, it makes you realize that actually nothing is certain in life. Um, and, and sort of saying, okay, that that's really sad. And it's an awful time that we're going through and, but how can I turn this around and 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 be appreciative of of things that are going on? So that's really great. And also the other thing that I I, I heard you you say then was that you've realised that other people's expectations are theirs alone, and so you can let go of those because they're nothing to do with you. You said that people had expectations of this little side project that you did, but actually. You're right. People don't realise how much work goes on behind the scenes um, to put something together until I suppose they do it themselves. Um, yeah. it, it, it's, it's tough though, isn't it? Because you, we're human and we want, we want to be liked and we want to be loved and we <laughs> want to be accepted. And when that doesn't happen, um, or if we feel it's not happening enough, it, it can be quite disconcerting. So to go through that you know, lesson of actually what other people do and what they think and what they say is no reflection of me. That is just so liberating. I mean, it's taken me 42 years to get there. I always say this in every podcast. (laughs) (laughs) It's taken me this bloody long to get to this point where I've kind of had this uh aha moment and gone, actually, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks as long as I'm treading lightly in the world and doing my best and doing my best that I can, because everybody's best is different, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Then, then really, what what am I worried about? Why am I getting anxious? And and what yeah. do I owe anyone? Any, I don't owe anybody anything. The very fact that I am spending a lot of time um, doing something I love and supporting others that that's enough. I mean, it's more than enough. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely, it's more than what I have ever done. So, but, but, but <laughs> I am I, but far I think... superior to you, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean? It, it's it's that kind yeah. of it's that kind of wow. Okay, I get it now. I get it. I, I don't. Why am I doing all this? What is driving me? And it's changing the driving. It's changing the fuel, isn't it? That pushes us forward, rather than kind of you know trying to prove ourselves or please yeah. others, you know, you kind of taken a step back in the last 12 months and gone, yeah. actually, what do I want? And what makes me happy? And yeah, exactly. It's easy yeah. to lose that. It's easy to forget. That that's yeah. what we started out doing when we went to university. In your case, you went to the University of uh, the Arts, London, yeah. um, studying type and graphic art. Is that right? Yeah. And then now you've come back sort of full circle, I guess. You're, you're sort of walking down the street in London and spotting type, type in everything. And, and, 
and and finding that actually your passion is in art you know you you said yeah. to me before we started this interview i'd really love to be known as a, an artist and a graphic designer and that's wonderful in the last 15 years i've been working it's really also been about how do i define myself and i think you know when you do talks i've i've done a lot of talks as well during lockdown last year i did about i think 10 online talks mm -hmm. um between march and and june um, and, and I have a couple of, of online talks still, um, lined up for this year. And, and, and each time you have to present yourselves and, and you actually realize in those moments as well, that you can tell what you want, you know, you can, yeah. you can, you can be, it's up to ourselves to define ourselves. And, and I think I, I had also this moment, um, about eight years ago when I was, uh, doing a printmaking residency in East London and I was only with other artists in the, in the studio. There weren't any graphic designers. And immediately I was defined as an artist. They, they would see the work I was doing and it was pretty much, you know, pop art, uh, screen prints. And they, they were saying, Oh, we, we'd like to wake up a new artist amongst us. And, and I thought, actually, this is interesting because it, depending on the community you're spending time with, some will say you're a graphic designer. Some will say you're an artist. And, and that made me realize that I can actually be both and I'd like to continue being both. Um, I'd like to keep running my, you know, my studio practice, uh, taking on graphic commissions, but I'd also like to dedicate, you know, more time and invest more in realizing my art projects and also just getting my hands dirty really and, and away from the computer. Um, yeah, but, and, and, and I think again, you know, when, um, when we define what a practice is, I, I think again, it was realizing that a, a design graphic design practice or studio doesn't have to be, you know, the image you've seen repeatedly of, you know, mm. 10 people in a, you know, pristine, white, very designed <laughs> office, um, you know, doing quite, you know, beautiful or corporate branding, and it can be many other things. And, and I think again, when, when I do talks in universities, I think for me, it's, it's been really important to, to say yes to those talks to show that there are different practices. And my practice is very different from the one of a bigger studio. Um, that I actually, you know, when I graduated, I only knew those studios. I didn't know other, um, smaller practices and, and, you know, yeah, I think. Yeah. So, so I think that's been really like a learning curve for me. And it's also embracing the fact that I am different and that what I do is very different. And, um, I think it's been important to realize that as well through those encounters and just be like, actually, you know, my practice is made of, a, of, of, of many things and it's working in areas such as the arts and culture and it's working with artists and galleries. Um, not to say that I don't want to work in other areas. I've been thinking about, no, about that not. as well in 2020. Yeah. Um, and I'd love, uh, you know, like uh, to try uh, working with, uh, you know, uh, different brands. And, you know, what? I'd, I'd love to also not just make screen prints on paper. I'd love to, uh, you know, make things for the home because I think obviously the home has become, um, you know, one of the central parts of our lives now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, just, I think being able to define yourself and not letting people define you. Hmm. Which is, it's, 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 it's such a release, isn't it? It's powerful. Yeah, it's really nice. It's, and it's, it's, yeah, it's just a warm feeling when you realize that actually we have probably spent, and I say we, um, I say you and I, not not the collective everyone, but, you know, probably spent a lot of our careers trying to make ourselves fit into something that um, doesn't really suit us. Um, and, and when you sort of have that moment when you're like, well, actually, I can do whatever I want and I don't have to sort of be defined by others. Um, I think it was Sophia Mono that got me onto that. She just sort of made this great analogy where she said, you know, something along the lines of, I realized that, you know, the, the, there wasn't a space for me at the table. So I decided to collect my own wood and build my own table. And then I would invite everybody to join me on it. Um, and I just wow, thought that yeah. was, that was a great way of 
um, you know, highlighting highlighting the way things were or, or still are in, in many cases. And, 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 you know, not to be negative about the creative industries or, or any industry for that matter. But, you know, I don't think I realised until um, in the last sort of couple of years, probably last year, that actually it's a very male environment. Um, yeah. And I, I think it was only last year that I started reaching out to um, other women and men um, in the creative industries and confiding in them. And I'm not saying you're not special, Sarah. There were a few other people <laughs> last year that I kind of formed really interesting friendships with. And, and, um, and um, you know, it was just, it was, I'd completely forgotten in all the hard work that it's important to have friends um, not just in, obviously in, in the rest of our lives, but friends who understand, who are in the same sort of world as you, because yeah. it, it can, it can get very lonely. I mean, I, I got very close with, and I'll mention them. I'm not sure they listen to this podcast. I'd cringe if they did, but um, <laughs> Peggy, Dan, Danny and Lauren last year and this year, I mean, we became so close um, and got, got each other through what was, you know, obviously a tough time. Um, and we had many laughs as well. And I just sort of thought, gosh, why hadn't, why didn't I have more of that before? Why, why did we get to the point where we thought that we could cope on our own? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I mean, um, I think that's a really important point as well, because on the one hand, I've always enjoyed, um, you know, being a small practice and, mm. you know, I've, I've had other people work with me at times, but at the moment it's just me and, um, but, but I have realized that sometimes it has been a very, very solitary journey. Mm. Um, and I mean, within my practice and that you need, you know, you need a really supportive, um, you know, group of people that can help you also on the outside and that it's, yeah. you know, you never make it solely on your own, I feel. No. Um, and, and, and I realized also that, you know, I had, like I think 2020 was also really transformative for me because, you know, I I could not stand any toxic energy during the pandemic, <laughs> and and I really sort of cut short anything that sort of I felt was, you know, hurtful to me or or not driving me and not helping me grow. Um, and I thought, I that's what I want to do when people approach me is I want to be kind and generous and. Yeah. help them grow. And I would expect the same from them. Um, and, and I just realized that anyone who was actually making me feel, um, you know, small mm. for the wrong reasons mm. did not have a space in my life. And I, I suddenly became really radical with that last year, because I think given everyone was so fragile, including myself, yeah. it was really important just to be very protective of, of oneself. And, but, but yeah, I think in, in terms of this idea of, you know, being solitary, on the one hand, I really like it. And on the other hand, I always thought, you know, I, oh, you know, what would it have been like to work in a, in a large studio and have lots of colleagues and sort of have all these, um, you know, sort of brainstorms. And I, I have worked with other designers, but it's never been like a really big group. So I've always been curious about that. But Again, since I've been like running my own practice in the last five years, I've, I've just realized that actually I really like that it's small and I mm. really like, and, and so it doesn't have to be within my practice, but it has to be within my community that I have people I can reach out to, I can talk to freely. And, and I think I'm, I'm sort of rebuilding that, um, network of people and, and also those, you know, friends that. I can feel in a safe space. Yeah, I, I, I totally, I think you and I have had a very similar experience because I've, <laughs> I've been doing exactly the same. I, I kind of, I think I stopped comparing myself to to others and, and to how, and, to, and you know, living up to other people's expectations. I think I finally got the kind of get go in me to say, okay, come on, you know, give, give yourself a break, Katie. I mean, it takes guts to to launch a studio. And I'm talking about you, not me here. It takes guts to launch your own studio and to go out there and stand in front of, um, younger people, younger aspiring designers, which I know you do a lot. You've, you've 
been a lecturer at the London College, College of Communication and you've, you've worked at CAS and 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 you share your wisdom. I, th- I know you've been on It's Nice, That's Nicer Tuesdays as well. And and to get up there as, as a sole um, studio um, in front of, you know, large swathes of uh, tomorrow's industry and large swathes of, of the existing um, community, that that is very it, it shouldn't have to i shouldn't have to say that it's brave but it is very brave because not not everybody has the guts to get up there and share their kind of experience um i mean yeah it's it's funny you say that because i mean half the time I'm, i mean even with the podcast i was slightly nervous i know me too but <laughs> this and is I was the really i was not, i don't think i was fun company in the last 24 hours <laughs> before the podcast I, I already feel a little bit like less stressed now but uh, I, I I think again it's you know it's thinking about representation and I think when you are given the platform to speak mm. I think it's important that we say yes and obviously I'm saying that I mean it's practice what you preach is really important and I have said no in the past to things because I just really freak out and I I am very um, anxious and self-conscious of what other people will think. And once, once I'm in it, it's, it's better, but it's the before moment and all the, mm. all the thoughts that go with it. And I am nervous. And so there, there are a couple of, you know, uh, big talks that I've been turning down. And, and obviously that, you know, luckily they have come back to me to ask me to, to speak again. And, and I forced myself to say yes, but uh, you know, I've, you know, and even the it's nice that nicer Tuesday. I mean, I love doing it because I met mm. um, Craig Oldham um, oh. <laughs> that you <laughs> yeah. also interviewed. Yeah, Craig has great. become a friend. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and I met also David Pearson at that talk, um, yeah. and we were all talking together on that evening. Lovely. And and I, you know, and one thing is to actually also realize that you know, doing these talks, you you forge sometimes lifetime, um, you know friendships or you connections really you really um, do and and, and, and yeah. also you get the chance to stand up in front of lots of people and 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 talk about your work um yeah. and and kind of and and that stays in people's minds it really does they 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 remember you and it's good for your sort of marketing it's good for your reputation and and it helps you build skills as well doesn't it yeah yeah it's um I think one thing also that I realized with all these talks is that Actually, they make you reflect as well, again, on where you are at and what you want to say about your practice. And mm. and, and again, you know, it's a, a friend also said to me, like, said, you should never turn down anything. <laughs> <laughs> and and I was a bit like, oh, gosh, like, really? <laughs> and, and, and I heard also <laughs> a couple of events organizers say we have so many women saying no to doing talks and and on the one hand, we understand mm. that they don't always have time, and but there's also a, a massive part of shyness and anxiety. And I, I also feel that, you know, it's it's asking why there is this shyness and anxiety, and sort of trying to work on that. And I've, you know, I've been working hard to be less anxious before I do talks, mm. and and I, and I think also being less anxious about you know, stop thinking about what people will think, but just think, this is my practice. This is how it is. It is different to yours and yours and yours. And, and this is what I do, you know, and, and not have this idea that it has to fit within that crowd specifically that is watching it. You know, it's, it's really, but it is still daunting. And and I think yeah. I'm always self-conscious about my work. Like, I mean, even when I do, you know, an online post and I'm sort of in the, in the next hour that follows, I'm sort of excruciated and I'm like, it's not good enough. It's not this, it's not that <laughs> but, pretty, but it's, it's hard. <laughs> it is hard. And, but that is the kind of wind in our sails, isn't it? If we weren't worried about these things, then we wouldn't drive ourselves to improve. We wouldn't push ourselves forward. Um, it's, it's a great kind of thing to have that, that fear. Fear is healthy. I think when we're creative, yeah. um, we, we sort of, I suppose we've been talking about the fact that we've realised that having this bravado, pretending that we're stronger than we are, um, kind of uh, ignoring the fact that we're human, because there is a bravado in us, and uh, if there's such a word, in the creative community where people are like, no, everything's fine, and I'm very successful, and have many, many leather bound <laughs> books, and uh, have many cigars. <laughs> And and I'm very successful, and and there's a kind of fear of showing vulnerability. 
responsibility and um, sharing mistakes. But actually, I think there was already a growing appetite for more realism uh, before the pandemic. And I think the pandemic only sped that up. Um, mm -hmm. People, are they kind of respond more to, rea to, to, to the real stories, to, to the real human behind the, the, um, the logo. And I think you're right. If you get up and, and give a talk, then it's remembering that actually you're just talking about yourself and your work and there's, there's nothing to be afraid of. Um, Yeah, exactly. And I think also as designers, you know, we're not like, we're not, and even artists, we're not, you know, we're not performers, we're not actors. No. And, and, and I think obviously some, some are really, really good at, at these, you know, at these talks and actually really give a performance. But again, it, I don't have to give a performance when I go up on a stage or when, when I'm speaking. And I, and I think just being myself has been, um, you know, the best learning curve. Mm, definitely. <laughs> it's like learning to be yourself. And it's, um, it's hard, and, isn't it? To, to learn who, who, to, to, to be yourself, to relax into yourself. That's really hard. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And, and I think, I mean, again, this is a bit personal, like I was hesitant to, to mention it, but I, um, in two, I think it was in 2019 mm. or, or was it a bit before, but I gave a talk um, at the house of St. Barnabas, actually with Craig Oldham as well. Um, and it was quite a small, intimate talk, like sort of salon discussion. Um, and I actually cried <laughs> when I gave the talk and I, I got really passionate and emotional and, and obviously I was really embarrassed after. And, um, I've had, um, you know, people who attended the talk actually that are still in touch with me since. And, mm. um, one has asked me to do an interview with her. Um, and, and, and I, and she actually explained to me and she said, like, you really like the fact you were so honest and that you let your emotions out mm. was really revealing for me at that time. And, and, and was, you know, a sort of breakthrough for her. That's fantastic. And, and I thought that's amazing because I think, I think again, it's, you know, it's kind of this veil that we have of like, you must be very stoic and do you say stoic? In, yeah, in English? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you must be, you know, always strong and put on a strong face and be very contained. And, and actually w when she told me this, I thought actually it takes one person to make you realize that you don't have to, and that you can be really emotional. And I think my work is, you know, emotional, passionate, hmm. instinctive, um, driven and, you know, <laughs> a lot of other things. Yeah. And, and, and why not, you know, like what I, I feel we're even with clients, like, I think the clients I've had the best relationship with have been the clients I've gone through, you know, many phases. Like we've mm. had great collaborations. We had really tough moments. We've had, um, you know, tough conversations. We've, you know, literally even sometimes, you know, there's been a bit of, I would say, well, I don't know, raising the voice. <laughs> um, and, and sometimes you're mortified because you're like, oh my God, we should have not had this chat. It's the mm. end of the relationship. And actually when you go, when you get beyond that, when you're allowed to show your emotions and when you can go beyond and when you accept both the client's emotions, but also they accept yours. Mm. I mean, that's what happened in, re in life relationships. Yeah. And that's when you build the strongest, longest relationships and when and when you feel you can talk about everything as well and I, and I think that's so important it's it's again building that safe space with the client and just being like hey this is how I create this is how I would like us to communicate and this is okay and is it okay with you you know mm. and and, you, and it's it's spot on business is about people after all and, and again it's, yeah. th it's that human it's that human touch And, and again, we're not making, you know, bank transactions, so we can be emotional about what we're making. I mean, we can. you know, most of the time I'm working on emotional projects. It's, you know, I'm working on, you know, with artists that have made very emotional, social community projects. And, and so we're not just like computers. And, and I think that's really important to mm -hmm. embrace that and just be like, Let's go through these emotions together. I mean, I don't want to scare people off like potential clients that would want to work with me after listening to this podcast. She's a nightmare. <laughs> I'm not a, like an emotional bundle and sort of unmanageable. No, I'm really like... <laughs> you're real. You're passionate about your work and that is very attractive. Um, and like you, you said that this this lovely lady who watched your talk and saw you well up, I mean... 
I suppose when you've got a reputation as big as yours, Sarah, people might tend to make assumptions about who you are as a person. So um, I think I think it's quite a common thing. We all we all kind of assume if somebody's kind of a bit famous um, that they're going to be a bit of an idiot. They're going to have an ego. Um, well, we all have an ego, but you know what I mean. They're going to have a big ego and they're going to be pompous. Um, so I had I did this podcast with Loz Ives last year, and um, we both had a nice chat before we hit record, and we just sort of said how funny it was that we all just assumed. Um, that everybody else in the industry were just idiots, you know, big dickheads. <laughs> and then when we when we actually met these people that we'd heard of for a long time, we actually realised they're just lovely and they're just normal. And I suppose your your reputation being as it is, you know, people might make the same assumption. They might think, oh, I bet she's got a big ego. But then when they go and see you talk and see that you're just, oh, wow, just a normal person with with a heart, <laughs> you know, just trying to make a living. It's easy for any of us to forget, I think, that actually we're all just human and we all need to cut ourselves and others a break. Um, and um, and I think the world would be a much nicer place. Yeah, and I think, again, we need to give ourselves time, like give each other time to get to know each other. I think it's there's a lot of very quick judgment uh, made. Mm. Um, and, and I think, you know, I've, I've discovered amazing people, in, again, in the industry and just, you know, and we're where actually I, I got, I was really surprised by actually who they were really were as opposed to what they would let out. Mm. And, and, and I think actually everyone in this industry is amazing, but it's sometimes we just have this shield, which I think gives the wrong impression. Yeah. And, and so I, I, I think, I think I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll remember that as well for myself and just, you know, just, keep on being a human being before being a designer. <laughs> I love that. And that's a really nice way to end this fantastic um, chat with you, Sarah. I could talk to you all day, as you know. Thanks so much for having me. It was so nice to speak. Thanks so much for listening. This is the Creative Boom podcast and I am your host, Katie Cowan. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor who's made this possible, Shillington, which is the original graphic design bootcamp. Find out more at shillingtoneducation.com. If you'd like to subscribe and listen to more of these podcasts, you can go to creativeboom.com forward slash podcast. And if you'd like to keep up with all the other content that's coming out of Creative Boom, go to creativeboom.com forward slash newsletter, where you will subscribe and receive our lovely email straight to your inbox every Tuesday. Until next time.